Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please click the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating yet another behavioral finance anomaly on financial markets that is associated with phases of the moon. And it is inspired by the 2006 paper by Johan et al, published in Journal of Empirical Finance, titled Are Investors Moonstruck? It claims that stock market returns are decidedly lower around full moons rather than new moons. And this can be quite directly linked to astrological superstitions and uh, the difference in investment decisions superstitious investors make subject to new moon or full moon phases. Even in mass culture, full moons can be associated with something spooky, so investors might be more pessimistic or more cautious surrounding the full moon phases, whereas new moon uh, phases can be associated with renewal, something positive, arguably. And therefore, if we believe that investors' superstitions might affect their investment decisions and financial market performance, we might want to test whether phases of the moon affect stock market returns. And here we have got data on daily S&P 500 returns from year-end 1927 all the way until year-end 2022, so almost a century worth of daily data for the S&P 500 index, and we calculate daily returns uh, as usual, uh, generating more than 20,000 individual data points. Then we have got days and times for full moons starting in 1900 and projected all the way uh, into 2050. So we can uh, actually utilize the timings of full moons to figure out uh, at which phase of the moon a potential particular return observation is. So first we need to figure out what is the most recent full moon uh, at a particular point in time that we're investigating. For that, it is easiest to use the max ifs function, refer to the range of full moons, and the criteria is that this full moon should come before the observation day we're currently at. So we refer to the full moon range again, and input the criteria that it needs to be less than our current date. Here we see that as of the 30th of December 1927, our most recent full moon uh, happened on the 8th of December 1927 at uh, 6.30 p.m. We can double right click it all the way down and we can see that as soon as we pass the next full moon, this is updated. So now we can calculate the number of days that have passed since the last full moon, which will be instrumental uh, in determining the lunar phase we're currently at. So we subtract the date and time of the most recent full moon from our date, and we see that uh, as of the 30th of December 1927, approximately 21 lunar days has passed since the last full moon, and then we can enforce it throughout the sample. We see that this uh, particular figure is uh, never uh, greater than the number of uh, lunar days in a lunar month, so uh, not higher than uh, 30. Again, you can use an approximation of 29.53 lunar days in a lunar month. That's what Johan et al. themselves use when determining the lunar cycle, and that's what we're going to do uh, a little bit later. First, let's calculate the lunar days, which will be just rounding down um, figures uh, based on the days since last full moon. So we round it to zero digit, round it to the nearest integer. And we can see that on full moons, if less than a day passed, we are at day zero. And um, in all other cases, it generates uh, a figure based on the number of lunar days the closest integer that have passed since the most recent full moon. Here, we can calculate average returns based on a lunar day and see how do they differ 
or if they differ at all throughout the lunar cycle. So here we can use average if function, refer to the range of lunar days. We can only start from the second row because we do not know the return for the first observation. So from the second until the very end. We refer to the lunar day over here. So lunar days can be zero uh, up to 29 inclusive. And we refer to the range of daily returns. And here we can see that the pattern emerges that is reasonably consistent with what uh, Johan et al. proposed. The highest returns can be observed around the new moon period, around the middle of the lunar month. Again, as the um, lunar cycle varies in terms of the number of days, it's approximately 29.53, our um, new moon will be around day 15, maybe 14 sometimes. So here we see that this is where the highest returns are observed. What Johan et al. also claim is that the lowest returns are observed around the full moon. So for lunar days 0, 1, 2, or lunar days uh, that are at the end of the lunar month, here it is not uh, as clear as the new moon um, uh, slice fact. We've seen that quite clearly here. However, the um, returns around the full moon are, well, reasonably high especially if we look towards the end of the lunar month, around day 29, they are indeed quite positive and uh, quite high, comparable to the magnitude of returns around day 15, around the new moon. However, to rigorously test for that, um, you and Natal propose uh, two estimation strategies. The first uh, estimation strategy is to assume that the effect is cyclical. So we have got uh, a lunar cycle, not only uh, astrologically, but also in terms of returns. And for that, they propose to estimate a cosine function. Uh, here, dt is the number of days since the full moon, so we can use this calculation to inform our lunar cycle variable. And as it uses a cosine function, this would be equal to 1 around uh, the full moon, around the lunar day 0, and negative 1 around the new moon. So if this um, variable would produce a negative coefficient, then the hypothesis of Jan et al. will be uh, verified. So for the lunar cycle variable, we use uh, a cosine function, 2 pi times the number of days since the full moon, divided by 29.53, which is the approximate number of days in a lunar month. And here we see that for our uh, end of the lunar month and start of the lunar month, this lunar cycle variable is indeed very close to 1, and if we go uh, on the other end, we can see that around the new moon here, for example, this variable is very close to negative one. So it quite naturally capture, captures potential cyclical effects associated with the lunar cycle and stock returns. For that, we can quite easily estimate a, a linear regression. Here we can retrieve the uh, effect of the lunar cycle on stock returns by regressing, so linest, our returns onto the lunar cycle variable starting from the second row again. We input one because we want the constant, we want one as we want the additional statistics, and we use enter to enforce this function. We see that indeed, just as Jörn et al. hypothesized, our coefficient value is negative, meaning that when the lunar cycle variable is positive and high, it's closest to one, it's the highest around the full moon, the stock market returns are actually smaller. Again, this uh, difference is not very large, but in terms of daily returns that uh, continuously compound over time, and we've got over um, 90 years worth of data, this difference of approximately one basis point per day uh, on a full moon uh, and uh, a positive difference of one basis point around the new moon, because remember, the lunar cycle variable equals negative one, or at least it's close to negative one around the new moon, uh, this difference can be economically significant, but is it statistically significant? For that, we can divide the coefficient for the lunar cycle variable by its standard error, and we get a t-stat that's less than 1 in terms of the magnitude, and we can evaluate it for significance using a tedious two-tailed function, plug in the absolute value of the t-statistic and the number of the degrees of freedom that is returned in the Linus template uh, as the rightmost element in the fourth row. And we see that our p-value is 37%, which is greater than 10%, uh, greater than any uh, 
significance threshold um, we can use. So it means that this effect is statistically insignificant. Although our returns are lower around the uh, full moon rather than around the new moon, this is not a reliable enough effect to inform trading strategies, for example, at least um, as far as the US market over the long uh, sample we investigate is concerned. But what's about the other approach that you and propose? Well, uh, the, the another approach uses uh, dummy variables. So uh, one, if we are close to a full moon and zero otherwise, if we are close to a new moon. And uh, the two main specifications you and use are a 15 day period and a seven day period. So a 15 day period, we use the full moon day, so day zero, and seven days after it, seven days before it. So for that, we can use an if function. So if the number of days since the full moon is less than or equal to seven, then we are in this 15 day period. Then if not, we need to check whether we are at the end of the lunar month. So if it's greater than or equal to 22.53, as again, the average number of days in the lunar month is 29.53, then we're still in this overlapping 15 day period. And if not, it's zero. That generates our first lunar dummy variable that is again equals one around the full moon. Here we can see that the um, window is quite wide. Here we use calendar days and not trading days. So it's not a 15 day window in terms of trading days, but that's to be expected as we've got weekends and holidays. And for the seven day lunar dummy, we take the uh, full moon day itself and three days after it and three days uh, up until it. So if the number of days since the full moon is less than or equal to three, we input one. And then if this is greater than or equal to 26.53, again, three days before the average uh, duration of a lunar month, we input one and zero otherwise. And that generates a much shorter window around the full moon for us to test the hypothesis that returns are significantly different. So then we can just change our line of specification to refer to a different explanatory variable. So checking for the 15 day um, lunar dummy. We still have got a negative coefficient uh, as expected. However, it's still statistically insignificant. And then we can refer to the seven day lunar dummy and that would generate a very similar result with effect being negative, albeit statistical, statistically insignificant. Why is it the case? As Yonatal reported statistically significant results for their um, lunar effect in the stock returns um, hypothesis. Well, that's due to the fact that um, they used a different sample. They first of all used the data only from 1973 until 2001. We use a sample that covers uh, 1928 through 2022, so a longer sample. And second, Yonatal used uh, a portfolio of country indices. They use value-weighted and equally-weighted uh, portfolios of uh, 48 um, country-specific stock market indices. And there, this effect actually becomes statistically significant. So the um, justification for the differences in what we have documented today and what Yuan Natal reported in 2006 can be twofold. First of all, this anomaly can be specific to a time period they investigated. 1973 through 2001. It might not have been prominent before that in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, as we have got those dates included. But also, it might be the fact that this anomaly is quite minor, quite uh, um, small in its magnitude, and we need a more powerful test to be able to detect it. And here is where uh, forming a 48 uh, country portfolio and uh, filtering out a lot of the idiosyncratic risk, a lot of noise that's associated with a particular country can help in uh, producing a more powerful test for the detection of the lunar effect. And that's all there is for detecting lunar phases and their impact on stock market performance. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos and business, finance, and economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and support us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.